into the mid-five figures and possibly higher. As I said, a significant market is Japan. Another is the Middle East, of course. The Saudis are the biggest buyers. Believe it or not, there's even a market in Iraq and Iran. Questions at this point? There were several, mostly good ones, which showed me this was a savvy group that had been brought together. I finally asked a question, though I was reluctant to as the FNG. Why do we think Elizabeth Connolly is connected to the others? I gestured around the room. I mean, this connected? Zelris answered quickly. A team took her. Kidnapping gangs are very common in the slave trade, especially in Eastern Europe. They're experienced and very efficient at the abductions, and they're connected into a pipeline. There's usually a buyer before they take a woman like Mrs. Connolly. She would be high risk, but very high reward. What makes this kind of abduction attractive is that there's no ransom exchange. The Connolly abduction fits our profile. Someone asked, Could a buyer request a specific woman? Is that a possibility? Zelrus nodded. If the money is right, yes, absolutely. The price might go into the six figures. We're working that angle. Most of the remainder of the long meeting was taken up with discussion about Mrs. Connolly and whether we could find her quickly. The consensus was no. One detail was particularly perplexing. Why would the unsubs kidnap the victim in such a public place? Profit slash ransom seemed the logical possibility, but there had been no ransom note. Had somebody specifically asked for Mrs. Elizabeth Connolly? If so, who? What was special about her? And why the mall? Surely there were easier abduction locations. As we talked about her, a photograph of Mrs. Connolly and her three daughters remained on the screen at the front of the conference room. The four of them looked so close-knit and happy. It was scary. Sad. I found myself thinking about being with Janie on our front porch the night before. Someone asked, These women who've been abducted, have any of them been found? Not one, said Agent Zelrus. Our fear is that they're dead, that the kidnappers or whoever the kidnappers deliver them to consider them disposable. Chapter 20 I returned to my orientation classes that day after the lunch break and just in time for another of SSA Horowitz's awful jokes. He held up a clipboard for us to see his material. The official list of David Koresh's theme songs. You Light Up My Life. I'm Burning Up. Great Balls of Fire. My personal favorite. Burning Down the House. Love the Talking Heads. Dr. Horowitz seemed to know that his jokes were bad, but black humor works with police officers, and his deadpan delivery was decent. Plus, he knew who had recorded Burning Down the House. We had an hour session on management of integrated cases, followed by law enforcement communication, then dynamics of the pattern killer. In the last course, we were told that serial killers change, that they are dynamic. In other words, they get smarter and better at killing. Only the ritual characteristics remain the same. I didn't bother to take notes. The next class took place outdoors. We were all dressed in sports jackets, but with padded throat and face protectors for a practical at Hogan's Alley. The exercise involved three cars in hot pursuit of a fourth. Sirens blared and echoed. Loudspeakers barked commands. Stop! Pull over! Come out of the car with your hands up! Our ammo, simunition, consisted of cartridges with pink paint-infused tips. It was five o'clock by the time we finished the exercise. I showered and dressed, and as I was leaving the training building to go over to the dining hall building where I had a cubicle, I saw SSA Nooney. He motioned for me to come over. What if I don't want to? You headed back to D.C.? he asked. I nodded and bit down on my tongue. In a while, I have some reports to read first. The abduction in Atlanta. 
Big stuff. I'm impressed. The rest of your classmates spend their nights here. Some of them think it helps build camaraderie. I think so, too. Are you an agent of change? I shook my head, then tried a smile on Nooney. Didn't work. I was told from the start that I could go home nights. That isn't possible for most of the others. Then Nooney began to push hard, trying to stir up old anger. I heard you had some problems with your chief of detectives in D.C., too, he said. Everybody had problems with chief of detectives Pittman, I said. Nooney's eyes appeared glazed. It was obvious he didn't see it that way. Just about everybody has problems with me, too. Doesn't mean I'm wrong about the importance of building a team here. I'm not wrong, Cross. I resisted saying anything more. Nooney was coming down on me again. Why? I had attended the classes I could make. I still had work to do on White Girl. Like it or not, I was part of the case. And this wasn't another practical. It was real. It was important. I have to get my work done, I finally said. Then I walked away from Nooney. I was pretty sure I'd made my first enemy in the FBI. An important one, too. No sense starting small. Chapter 21 Maybe it was guilt, churned up by my confrontation with Gordon Nooney, that made me work late in my cube on the lower level of the dining hall building where behavioral science had its offices. The low ceilings, bad fluorescent lighting, and cinder block walls kind of made me feel as if I were back at my precinct. But the depth of the back files and research available to FBI agents was astonishing. The Bureau's resources were better than anything I'd ever seen in the D.C. Police Department. It took me a couple of hours to go through less than a quarter of the white slave trade files, and those were just cases in the U.S. One abduction in particular caught my attention. It involved a female D.C. attorney named Ruth Morgenstern. She had last been seen at approximately 9.30 p.m. on August 20th. A friend had dropped her off near her apartment in Foggy Bottom. Ms. Morgenstern was 26 years old, 111 pounds, with blue eyes and shoulder-length blonde hair. On August 28th, one of her identification cards was found near the north gate of the Anacostia Naval Station. Two days later... Her government access card was found on a city street, but Ruth Morgenstern was still missing. Her file included the notation, most likely dead. I wondered, was Ruth Morgenstern dead? How about Mrs. Elizabeth Connolly? Around ten, just as I was starting to do some serious yawning, I came across another case that snapped my mind to attention. I read the report once, then a second time. It involved the abduction 11 months earlier of a woman named Jilly Lopez in Houston. The kidnapping had occurred at the Houstonian Hotel. A team, two males, had been seen loitering near the victim's SUV in the parking garage. Mrs. Lopez was described as very attractive. Minutes later, I was speaking to the officer in Houston who had handled the case. Detective Steve Bowen was curious about my interest in the abduction, but he was cooperative. He said that Mrs. Lopez hadn't been found or heard from since she disappeared. No ransom was ever requested. She was a real good lady. Just about everybody I talked to loved her. I'd heard the same thing about Elizabeth Connolly when I was in Atlanta. I already hated this case, but I couldn't get it out of my skull. White girl. The women who'd been taken were all lovable, weren't they? It was the thing they had in common. Maybe it was the kidnapper's pattern. Lovable victims. How awful was that? Chapter 22 When I got home that night, it was quarter past eleven, but there was a surprise waiting for me. A good one. John Sampson was sitting on the front steps. All six foot nine, two hundred fifty pounds of him. He looked like the Grim Reaper at first, but then he grinned and looked like the Joyful Reaper. Look who it is, Detective Sampson. I smiled back. 
How's it going, man? John asked as I walked across the lawn. You working kind of late again. Same old, same old. You never change, man. This is the first late night I've had at Quantico, I responded a little defensively. Don't start. Did I say anything bad? Did I even cut you with the first of many line that's right there on the tip of my tongue? No, I didn't. I'm being good. For me. But since we're talking, you can't help yourself, can you? Want a cold beer? I asked, and unlocked the front door of the house. Where's your bride tonight? Samson followed me inside, and we got a couple of Heinekens each. We took them out to the sun porch. I sat on the piano bench, and John plopped down in the rocker, which strained under his weight. John is my best friend in the world, and has been since we were ten years old. We were homicide detectives and partners, until I went over to the FBI. He's still a little pissed at me for that. Billy's just fine. She's working the late shift at St. Anthony's tonight and tomorrow. We're doing good. He drained about half of his beer in a gulp. No complaints, partner. Far from it. You're looking at a happy camper. I had to laugh. You seem surprised. Samson laughed, too. Guess I didn't think I was the marrying kind. Now all I want to do is hang with Billy most of the time. She makes me laugh, and she even gets my jokes. How about you and Jamila? She good? And how is the new job? How does it feel to be a Phoebe down at Club Fed? I was just going to call Jam, I told him. Samson had met Jamila, liked her, and knew our situation. Jam was a homicide detective, too, so she understood what the life was like. I really enjoyed being with her. Unfortunately, she lived in San Francisco, and she loved it out there. She's on another murder case. They kill people in San Francisco, too. Life in the Bureau is good so far. I popped open the second of my beers. I need to get used to the bureaucrats, though. Uh-oh, Samson said. Then he grinned wickedly. Crack in the walls already? The bureaucrats. Authority problems? So why are you working so late? Aren't you still in orientation, whatever they call it? I told Samson about the kidnapping of Elizabeth Connolly, the condensed version. But then we moved back to more pleasant subjects. Billy and Jamila. The allure of romance. The latest George Pelicanos novel a detective friend of ours who was dating his partner and didn't think anybody was on to them. But we all knew. It was like it always was when Samson and I got together. I missed working with him. Which led to the next thought. I needed to figure out some way to get him into the FBI. The big man cleared his throat. Something else I wanted to tell you, talk to you about. Real reason I came over tonight, he said. I raised an eyebrow. Oh? What's that? His eyes avoided mine. Kind of difficult for me, Alex. I leaned forward. He had me hooked. Then Samson smiled, and I knew it was good, whatever he was about to share. Billy's got herself pregnant, he said, and laughed his deepest, richest laugh. Then Samson jumped up and bear-hugged me half to death. I'm gonna be a father. Chapter 23 Here we go again, my darling Zoya, said Slava in a conspiratorial whisper. You look very prosperous, by the way. Just perfect for today. The couple looked like all the other suburban types wandering around the crowded King of Prussia Mall, the second largest in America, according to promotional signs at all the entrances. There was good reason for the mall's popularity. Greedy shoppers traveled here from the surrounding states because Pennsylvania had no tax on clothing. These people all look so wealthy. They have their shit together, said Slava. Don't you think? You know the expression I'm using, having your shit together? It's American. Slang. Zoya snorted out a nasty laugh. We'll see how together their shit is in an 